So this panel is entitled Widow Rights and Widowhood Rights, R-I-T-E-S. Um, our discussant is Casey Golomsky from the University of New Hampshire. Uh, and Casey will be offering comments on two of the papers uh, that ended up being on this panel. The first one is Four Months, Ten Days and Beyond, Widowhood Rights in a Muslim Sudanese Village by Rohaya Mustafa Abu Sharaf um, from um, Georgetown University in, um, um, I'm sorry, Rohaya, what campus are you on? In Qatar. In Qatar, okay. And um, the second paper is Widows and Their Worth, The Gendered Politics of Intestate Succession in Postcolonial Ghana by Kate Skinner at the University of Birmingham. And we've also invited Casey to provide some, um, to provide some comments on his own work, um, given that this is a panel that's a little bit shorter. So Casey, you have the floor. Thanks for the um, invitation and for the chance to be here. Twitter is a is a weird space and a magical one to be invited for <laughs> for panel participation surreptitiously after missing formal calls for papers. So I love the the informality of of ASA connections in the Twitterverse. Um, Twitter is always keeping me on my toes and in many ways, theoretically and practically. So thanks to Emily and Ben for the invitation and accommodations. Um, and thank you to um, Professor Zabu Sharaf and Skinner for your really wonderful papers. Um, yeah, I, I've said no to lots of things this semester in interest of self-preservation, but African studies I need to come through is <laughs> um, looking at the overall program of the conference, it's like, wow, people are really putting out for this. Um, you know, similar to what we saw at NUSA a couple of weeks ago, Liz, like we, we need to be behold each other, so. I guess I can do the conventional where we have um, some summative uh, review of both of the, the papers and then um, some specific questions for each that are embedded within kind of uh, the summation of the paper and um, specific questions for each author. And then in the interest of synthesis um, and bridging conversations kind of, uh, questions that bring them together. And um, yeah, maybe after that I can, I, I think it'll maybe dovetail into what I'd like to, um, you know, share briefly about my own um, work on widows. So um, I read them first, uh, Professor Skinner and then Abu Sharaf. So I'll go with um, Professor Skinner's first, um, which is a wonderful project born out of a, a kind of like an applied focus, this archives of activism I loved hearing about. Um, your kind of multifaceted project with the filmmaker and the um, the activists um, and the the archives kind of this great synthesis so um, kind of trying to situate why and how this law PNDC law 111 came out under the um, one of the Rawlings uh, <laughs> um, periods of governance and and particularly how it um, brought about new iterations of intestate succession, i.e. who will inherit your property if there's no will, um, and who gets to devise the plans for that under um, what kind of legal prescriptions or entities. And you've nicely laid out that in Ghana, we have statute law, common law, and the um, wonderfully plural um, ethno-linguistic and regional varieties of customary law and the multiple forms of marriage, lifelong union under the colonial ordinance, the Mohammedan um, ordinances, and again, the varieties of customary um, marriage and its consecrations, um, which I think you, you pointed out kind of solidified in the colonial period as you're gonna have kind of like a matrilineal kind of <laughs> marriage or a patrilineal one, right? Um, and so these descriptive categories really like reifying for people how and to whom they're beholden. Um, and at the turn of, uh, at kind of the period of independence and decolonization, um, we have these kind of nationalist sensibilities of parenting um, and duties and obligations to um, their children as, you know, being good persons, but also being good citizens in this new nation. You nicely iterated that. Um, but how we had um, kind of hurdles and um, debates about 
um, how this played out in terms of maintenance versus inheritance to the 1970s, and then we see the legal reforms in the 80s, the gender neutral um, uh, promulgation of the term spouse um, and applying to all forms of marriage, um, giving rights to widows and their children to remain in the matrimonial home as tenants in common um, with properly divided proportionally as residue. And you provide kind of a very, um, I mean, I don't read a lot of legal history, but I imagine this is what like legal scholarship looks like, where it's like, these are the hypotheses of why, <laughs> why this has happened and let us um, refute them. <laughs> um, yeah, so your, your four hypotheses. One is, you know, why did this um, law 111 um, solidify and take off in the 80s um, under Rawlings? One hypothesis was that it was a tilt um, towards um, conjugal marriage as kind of a predominant form of, of marriage and relationships, um, and that this was um, due to socioeconomic change. Um, in the paper and the presentation on the video, you say this is um, not necessarily the case, arguably. Um, and in the in the paper, you kind of um, prov uh, provoked us to say, well, I have some more to say about this, but um, in the interest of space, I'll leave it out. So um, maybe I think you could share with us some of the um, paragraphs you would have included to give us evidence of why the sociological um, findings and the social historical findings from the 80s, like how does that show that it was not, um, you know, it, it was, it, we cannot kind of say it was due to socioeconomic change or conjugality as kind of a predominant form that would have solidified this law. Um, you present the case that there were decades of women's activism, women's technocratic activism with Judge Annie Jaggi that focused on the incompatibilities of lineage and companionate marriage, the need to phase out polygyny, kind of a, um, a globalized women's rights kind of approach to these things. Um, you said this was also though not the case. And um, I think I was under the impression that even though these things were happen, happening, it doesn't forcefully explain why this law solidified in the 80s. Um, maybe you can um, strengthen that, um, the proposition that this is not a, a rewarding hypothesis for us. Um, and then more tellingly, and once the, the kind of two hypotheses that you uh, say are much uh, more stronger to um, help us understand why this came about was that the military regimes um, kind of during this period or these authoritarian regimes have a paradoxical association with um, pro-womenist, um, pro-women kind of policies. And that you mentioned this term called first ladyism. And I was really, I, I was like, oh my gosh, who are, what is, what is first ladyism? I want us to know about that. But kind of how elites working within the government were not necessarily progressive or radical. And that this might explain why the law um, came into being because it wasn't radical. It kind of conceptualized women as mothers, again, erring towards the lineage versus women as um, wives with kind of aut autonomy and agency. Um, so the kind of initial questions I, I had for you, um, yeah, we're, we're please um, uh, elaborate on, you know, kind of what the, the sociology of marriage looked like in the 80s um, to help us understand better hypothesis one. And really, I wanted to know more about this um, tenant in common practice that the widows and the children could, uh, could kind of grasp onto. What is the significance of the home as a physical property and its attendant land um, use rights? And this is of real interest to me. My um, main African studies advisor, my first one was Victoria Tashin, who wrote the, the I Will Not Eat Stone book. So I studied with Vicky and had to read all of her dissertation transcripts about, you know, who gets the cocoa land. And, you know, and I think it, it just is always like bringing me back to that. Um, who gets to sit in this place? Um, I think home is a physical dwelling site and the people that inhabit it, you know, either living in a house on the property or buried underneath the ground, um, there might help us understand, you know, if these are more like conservative enduring customary law practices, does it make sense if they're kind of enveloped in this 
relatively non-radical law. Um, so that was uh, maybe a, some starting questions for, for you. Um, and now I'll move on to um, Professor Abu Sharaf. So this was a passionately written paper and I'm, I mean, I'm really actually stunned that I'm commenting on your paper, <laughs> Professor Abu Sharaf, like this is luminaries, <laughs> among the luminaries here. Um, writing how rights of widowhood are autonomy stripping, um, the transitive verb of, of widow, like using it as a verb, reinvented as traditional through Sharia law. Interlocutors, she writes, are emphasizing the importance of homegrown critiques of these disempowering practices. Um, and this was really uh, key for me because while we heard a lot about um, kind of technocratic and rights organizations work in Professor Skinner's in um, your paper, it's much more the voice of women themselves, which as an ethnographer, I so much appreciate. Um, and I wondered though, are, what are like the um, kind of uh, civic spaces that women might be able to articulate these um, complaints in beyond the research encounter? That was a question I had. And um, Professor Boucherov focuses on three different rights in the paper. One is the Ida Habis of widow confinement, um, which is also embodied in the title of the article. Um, the temporalities of waiting are so fascinating. Um, and in the cases that I work on, again, also twined to um, uh, menstruation, um, uh, gestation of children and the like, and seasonalities, um, kind of these convergences of, of fertility symbolisms. Um, evocatively writing about um, not only stigma, but boredom in these places and kind of the politics that can be engendered in, in um, boredom. Uh, speaking also to inheritance like Professor Skinner, um, inheritance without male heirs or childless. Um, and I wonder if we can have, you know, eventually kind of a, a, a cross paper conversation about the similarities and differences here. We're both talking about inheritance. Um, and finally, the, the rights of infibulation or adal. Um, I really wanted to just comment and say the storytelling is superbly descriptive in this paper, even as the content is quite mortifying. Um, these are oral historians to me, um, or kind of like literati as you're, you're citing um, so long a letter as well. Malka's story stood out to me as the gold suffer, the gold sniffing dogs and police interrogations of her widowed neighbor and Asia's plot ploy of the sexualized castigation of her late husband's kin, these pitiful male mosquitoes that are coming to the... <laughs> I was like, I don't want to be in the room. There is some reading going on. <laughs> um, and it was the, the passion that these women um, evoked in their storytelling, you met in a, in a very powerful move of, of dialogical ethnography. I think your not holding in abeyance anything here. And I think there's something really productive when you're conversing in the same register as your, as your interlocutors. Um, so uh, questions that I had specifically um, for, for you here, one of the um, kind of opening caveats was that these women are differentially positioned vis-a-vis -vis ethnicity, class, and race. Um, race is a topic that's increasingly important to me. I mean, as should be to all of us, but working in um, South Africa on what is race at the end of life. Um, can you elaborate more on um, the racial dimensions here? Is this, are, are there differences that we can see um, related to kind of the uh, secession and new creation of South Sudan? Um, and this is also leading me to kind of converse between the two. We have one very historical and one very ethnographic paper. So um, an additional question for Professor Boucherov is, can you um, historicize or periodize the Sharia law that is, con that is shaping all of this? Um, are these Sharia invocations um, part of a recent fundamentalist revival? Um, how can we situate this, um, kind of the, the structure of Sharia that is inducing these feelings, even the feelings of women wanting to sew themselves up again, how can we situate that in time? And then for Professor Skinner, um, a, a deeply historical paper, but um, can we, 
um, I guess, enliven it uh, somehow through some interview data additionally that you, you would feel comfortable sharing. Um, and maybe a race question for, for you, um, Professor Skinner, too, is that, you know, Rawlings, I read, I remember reading in Jamima Pierre's book, um, The Predicament of Blackness, and she really talks about Rawlings as like this very pan-Africanist. And so there's like a very racial dimension, like a black dimension to that, that to me is also maybe twin to like a very modern man sensibility, um, you know, like the the big man leading these these nations into the new world order. So co-constructs of gender and race, um, I guess for both of you to consider. Um, I'll leave it at that. I've been talking a little bit. So why don't I, we turn it over to um, uh, Professor Skinner first. Well, Casey, there. do you want to first talk a little bit about your own work? Um, sure. <laughs> I guess I don't want to take up too much air in the room. Is it okay well, if we you distribute know, the yeah, voice? Why don't, why don't you just, why don't you just share with people what you're, a little, a little bit about what you're interested in. Where oh, you're, okay, sure. And then we'll, and then we'll turn to Kate and, and Okay. Yeah, maybe I can, yeah, I'll share a little bit, um, I guess, why I'm on this kind of like the bent of like race and widows. Um, yeah, I've been doing um, research for the past few years on the topic of race and aging in South Africa. My first book was on um, funeral, AIDS funerals in Eswatini. And so there was a lot of material that I worked with there that had to do with the same issues of, you know, of customary law versus uh, the Western courts. How is that navigated? Um, where are women's bodies in the land so their children can claim um, property? Uh, also writing on like how are widows using commercial spaces like life insurance to, to gain um, kind of material power and so how are they beholden to kinship networks even though they're buying like independent life insurance policies. But, my new work um, is is based in South Africa. Um, I wonder if I can maybe share like one or two s pictures um, from a slideshow. Is that okay somehow? Of course. I think you should have the screen share option below. Maybe um, I think Emily might have to permit permit such, but um, it's okay mm -hmm. if we don't have to. Can you do that, um, Emily? Usually, you have to make someone co-host to allow them to screen share. Oh, I just so made you a host, Casey. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. So for the past few years, I've been doing ethnography in an old age home in South Africa, um, a single old age home that was run, that's run by an Afrikaner women's charitable organization. It's located um, near Kruger National Park. Um, and this is a space where um, there bring, I mean, in, in post-colonial analysis, we see, you know, like let's attend to co-constructs of, of gender and race and class, but age is very rarely, I think, included as a variable. And it's very um, powerful to behold um, that in a space that is ostensibly a house of widows. Um, and so this is a multiracial um, nursing home. And, uh, you know, again, considering like race policies, Black uh, women are kind of only in these spaces because of post-apartheid social work vetted um racially equitable kind of admissions processes um and what does it mean when you're inhabiting the space with somebody who is kind of your ostensible oppressor during apartheid um and you were on the site of the struggle or the resistance and now your roommates kind of at the also the edge of memory as many people are living in the stages of cognitive decline um an interesting kind of facet that I was going to um, attend to had I gotten my act together to write a whole paper was how the notion of widows, I think in African studies is a very racialized phenomenon. And that was kind of made clear to me in this space, how the status of widow is marked and unmarked. Obviously um, this place is like, you know, like um, older populations around the world, women tend to live longer than men. Um, white women are widows by the fact that their husbands have died from metabolic disorders, typically. Um, black women, so these are like two widows right here. And you can obviously kind of see the disparity in, in age here. Um, uh, one, uh, you know, husbands dying of metabolical disorders in, in the case of white widows and in the case of um, black women who are predominantly staff in the home. 
um, their husbands dying of HIV AIDS and violence earlier in the life course. Um, in these homes, white women um, typically do not at all articulate the category of widow. It's like a word that I never heard used by any of the white staff or the white um, uh, residents of the home, um, which might attest to kind of its, you know, sorted dimensions as a category. It's too stigmatizing and kind of the logic of like permanent personhood. Like, the, you know, you're still living your life. You're not hampered by... Um, by, by death in this way and sort of uh, moving towards a cosmic dimension of aging versus um, black staff members in the home attending quite strongly to the rituals, um, Sitsanga, Siswati, other kind of um, cultural forms of identifying themselves as widows. So wearing widow's attire over their nursing uniforms in these homes. Um, and just that, that cultural contrast that I saw here is clearly kind of a racial one um, that, you know, is, is structured by kind of the unequal distributions of, of labor and life course, who gets to live longer under particular working conditions, um, and just um, made me think more critically about who is a widow and how is the, maybe the category of widow um, a racialized phenomenon in um, African um, populations. So I guess I'll, that's kind of what led me to think more about like how is race a, an invisible thing, but still very present in both of these cases, so. Marvelous, um, thank you. Yeah. Um, Kate Pohaya, would you like to respond to some of Casey's comments and then we can open for questions? Okay, I think Kate should go first. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Casey. It's, uh, it's nice to meet you, actually. We had a workshop on marriage in Africa in my department in 2017, and Katrine Peep um, mm -hmm. told us we should have your reading on the life insurance and marital mm -hmm. estrangement. So we actually read that as a group in 2017. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think what probably happened in this paper is pretty contextualize it a bit because I mentioned in the paper that I'm working with a group of people in Ghana and obviously because of COVID I haven't been able to go there as much as I would otherwise have done and the visits that they were supposed to make here have not um, worked out either. So I envisage in the fairly near future that myself, Akosua, Adamako, Ampofo, and Jovia Salafu will be kind of developing this um, perhaps more jointly in the future, but the way the kind of circumstances meant that I sort of had to have a first go myself at um, knocking something out using um, some of the interview transcripts that they'd actually been generating in Ghana. So kind of our nicely conceived joint project has kind of become a little bit disjointed in the COVID thing, but hopefully we'll find ways of bringing everything back together mm. again. Um, I'm happy to have this opportunity because I realized when I um, did my recorded video that I'd sort of, I think I'd become very anxious about understanding the ins and outs of the law. And I'd spent a lot of time trying to understand all the different legal systems and this, you know, so the focus in the paper was very, um, I think it reflects that anxiety that I wanted to kind of get the legal scholarship correct. Um, and then when I'd sort of finished doing that, I thought, well, how actually am I going to put this in dialogue with other people who were not specifically concerned with Ghana? So I kind of feel pleased to have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I also had second thoughts about calling the the hypotheses afterwards. I felt like maybe it was a little bit positivist and that actually these were kind of avenues of inquiry or potential explanatory frameworks rather than hypotheses as such. Mm. I could probably reword that if I was going back to it. Um, so you'd asked about the kind of sociological scholarship and I think this is one of the areas where perhaps Akosua will be able to strengthen what I have sort of started drafting. But um, I mean, some authors have actually commented on how hard it is to use census data. 
um, or even the GLRLSS, which is the Ghana Living Standards Survey data, to really to be very sure about patterns because obviously what people are doing at a particular snapshot in the census doesn't always reflect the kind of the marital career and the changes. So I think what came out of some of the specific court cases that I looked at was the way that single individual could be living in an ordinance marriage at one point in life, but then become a widow or a widower and then enter a customary law marriage and so on. Um, and I think it's like when the memorandum to the intestate succession law talked about the growing importance of the conjugal family. I think that was quite vague because even if you could demonstrate according to survey data that um, practices of husbands and wife living apart, which used to be quite common, mm -hmm. that they've become less common. And in that sense, conjugality has become a more important mode of residence. That doesn't necessarily tell you about other spheres of life. It doesn't necessarily tell you about inheritance practice. It doesn't necessarily tell you um, about use of um, income and assets. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of things that it doesn't, like burial as well. Like some, I read something recently by Amma Hammond, who was arguing that ultimately the lineage still buries its members mm -hmm. so any argument that conjugality has become more important it's like what do you mean more important in what sphere of life has it become more important mm -hmm. so i think that's where i was going with that the memorandum kind of presented the law as catching up with a reality in mm -hmm. which Ghanaians were all living in conjugal units and i just i just don't think that holds up okay um that makes sense the first ladyism that idea comes from I mean, it was Amina Mama who made that kind of a famous phrase and I've sort of picked up on it. Mm -hmm. And what she was kind of driving at was um, sort of phases where military rulers, um, you know, the first lady would form a women's movement and then this would kind of in some ways enable particular forms of progress for women, but would enable it in ways that were not fundamentally challenging. Mm -hmm. to a political structure that remained quite patriarchal. Mm. So I think I was, I think what had kind of bothered me was that loads of people have written about intestate succession law in Ghana. Like there's so many Ghanaian legal scholars who've commented on this. And I think what I wanted to ask as a historian is, why did this law pass in 1985? <laughs> because, mm -hmm. you know, there were people in 1955 who were advocating for exactly the same type of law. So why in 85? Mm -hmm. And I felt that we had to consider the possibility that, um, a particular brat combination of first ladyist influence and mm. um, the pressure that came from the fact that Ghana had signed the CEDAW but not ratified the CEDAW, that mm. possibly these two things came together to explain mm. why particularly 1985. I wouldn't say that's something that I've 100% settled on and others in the project team may also have a slightly mm. different take on that but Mm. I felt like we had to consider it as a possibility. Um, and I think just finally say briefly that um, the intestate succession law and the agitation around it, it, it holds in both rural contexts where farming land is at stake, but also in urban contexts where urban houses are at stake too. So it kind of, it has slightly different manifestations, but these issues appear across the board. Mm. And I'll stop there because otherwise I'll take mm. up too much time. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. Hohaya? I know it's very late there in Qatar. I think it's after 10 p.m. So we do appreciate you staying with us so long. <laughs> You're currently muted, though. Foremost, I would like to express how thankful I am for Benjamin and for Emily. When Benjamin, I have to give you the back story. When he told me that he's going to organize um, a panel on widowhood, he said, can you please contribute to this panel? I have never worked on widowhood before. So I said, I will say yes and do the research later. 
so thank you very much for just giving me the opportunity to think on my feet. Uh, there are some issues that I wanted to talk about that bothered me all along, uh, which I pointed at in the paper. Uh, the issue of the idda or the interment, the issue of inheritance, the issue of free infibulation, something that uh, you talked about then earlier about people experiencing it multiple times and so on. Uh, so I, I started, instead of starting by some kind of a theory, I wanted to try to like Kate, I also couldn't go back to the Sudan because of COVID. I had plans laid out to do comparative studies in different places between a village in Rofa, in uh, the Blue Nile, and in Khartoum, you know, and different places. I couldn't. And, and so I um, changed actually the, my title just to help my thinking. In, in instead of saying four months and ten days, um, I'm envisioning a new project called Controversies in the House of Wailing, mm -hmm. the place where people go to say their condolences when somebody passes, is called the House of Wailing, Beit Al Bika. Uh, so, and so I uh, also said some scenarios from some widows. Because here, uh, I wanted, for the purposes of this discussion, is just to use and to share with you what I have, and then I will continue, of course, with more of my collection of ethnographic narratives. Um, as, as Casey uh, correctly pointed out from the very start, uh, I felt that Widowhood cannot be really essentialized. I didn't want to talk about uh, a homogeneous experience that everybody shares as a widow, given the fact that we live in a country that is multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. So there are uh, the other issue uh, that was also brought by Richard, which is uh, Anne Matthias, that is excellent. Uh, the issue of the conflation of Islamic law, Sharia, and, and the traditional, so-called traditional practices. Um, so these blur boundaries have always been at the front, forefront of my thinking about the issue. Uh, the, um, very clearly, when you talk about Idda internment, when uh, a widow has to stay, or a divorcee, uh, has to stay for four months and 10 days. These are counted by ministerial period uh, to a certain uh, paternity. There is the issue of the fear of the mixing of lineages. So the assumption that uh, I don't think it has been a good day for anthropology when I was reading, the, <laughs> writing this paper. <laughs> that, okay, the assumption is that if uh, a widow leaves for any reason, even if she's a breadwinner, uh, if she leaves the house, she might engage in sex. So before the four months and 10 days, Maybe she will sleep with somebody else, and, and therefore, this no one uh, can tell for sure whether the hypothetical sex partner or the deceased husband um, was the father. Is she in a position to ask for a DNA, even if that unseemly and unwieldy uh, scenario materialized? So question marks, this is still a question of power so, uh, and, and the limitations on one's agency. Uh, so by the same token, when I don't talk about widowhood as an essential category, uh, as a stable category, I also don't want to uh, 
uh, talk about Islamic law or a, a singular Islamic stance uh, regarding widowhood because I, I really need to look more into the different schools of interpretations and, and how these are adjudicated, these kinds of cases. Uh, so um, I am very cognizant of uh, Clifford Geert's uh, contributions of religion as a cultural system, which in a, in a longer paper, I will deal with this uh, theoretical facet of it in depth. Uh, but I wanted to uh, to see, for example, um, the structures of feeling, as uh, Raymond Williams put it, how people do actually feel about these issues, mm -hmm. these these four months and ten uh, days. Mm -hmm. uh, how about postmenopausal women, mm -hmm. women widows in their seventies who are supposed to uh, as I said, Fatima, for example, said, this is so irrelevant to me. <laughs> I am 70. What, what are the odds of my getting pregnant? <laughs> or finding a <laughs> or even uh, hallucinating about the idea. So uh, people were critical. And I think they left room for this uh, internal cultural critique that I said, homegrown. Uh, and uh, you ask Casey a good question about what what is spaces uh, can can this conversation actually about gender justice take place about widows justice, and it is really very interesting that uh, in the Sudan you have some of the most uh, powerful women's movement. We have the equal pay for equal work from 1952. Mm -hmm. And this is four months before independence from the from the British. Wow. Uh, agitation for women's rights, for voting rights, for equitable. So when I tried to look at widows and literature on widows, it was really conspicuously lacking. And that is why I appreciated the opportunity to try to be part of mm -hmm. uh, this conversation. So I don't, until now, I don't think that there is any systematic effort from the million, you know, the thousands of NGOs working on women's rights and raising funds like crazy. Uh, but I don't think that the issue of widowhood is, is uh, central to these kinds of uh, uh, NGOs. The question of race was also very important to me. Uh, and I wanted to say, if, if you can entertain an anecdote. When yes. I was, this is uh, the African storytelling <laughs> passion. <laughs> so, so when uh, I was in elementary school, my best friend was of, South Sudanese descent, and we shared the same bench with six other kids. Uh, and uh, we had religious instruction almost every single day. So the teacher asked my friend in Shira, her name, she said, I want you to come up, you know, in front of the class and recite a certain Quranic ver verse. First of all, if we weren't expecting that was going to be the surprise assignment. Secondly, when my friend went in front of, here we are in fourth grade, went in front of the class, she was of course embarrassed and ashamed that she, and afraid. So she said, you know, miss, I, I, I don't know, I don't know this verse. She was Muslim, but of uh, South Sudanese Shuluk uh, group. She was beaten. She was beaten by the teacher uh, and sent to the principal's office. So what I did is, as soon as the class was over, I went with her to the principal's office as character witness. <laughs> 
And while the principal was saying, what brings you by? Why, why did the teacher send you here? Before my friend started to talk, I said to her, I beg your pardon. First of all, she didn't tell us that she's going to give us this Quranic verse. And secondly, I think she beat her because she is from South Sudan. That, of course, all hell broke loose. <laughs> I was asked, <laughs> I was beaten too. Asked and, and, and told that I can't come back to school without my guardian, without bringing my father. <laughs> so my father went back the next day to defend me and my friend's honor <laughs> before the principal. So growing up in the Sudan with these kinds of, uh, of knowledge that there was always a civil war, uh, ingrained in me this since that race has always figured prominently in, the, in everyday life. Mm -hmm. Darfur happened, and the genocide in Darfur, and the genocide in South, South Sudan. So you have a lot of widows, war yeah. widows. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, for, for this particular paper, I didn't mm -hmm. have the space to try to talk about this. Mm -hmm. but. By, by, by because of the war and because of these the, the, the cities of widows mm -hmm. that these people are the sole breadwinners and they cannot afford to be interned or confined for four months and ten days mm -hmm. so, uh, so that is I think uh, the, the racial dimension that I need to uh, look into more deeply and try to uh, mm. show how these also are um, implicated, these kind, you know, race. Class, um, internment itself is a class issue that you can afford it. You can afford that actually mm. to stay mm -hmm. uh, indoors. Mm -hmm. But all in all, uh, my interviewees and, and, and the stories that I was privy to from childhood until now, you know, in, in the Sudan, people talk about this widowhood, about the, the conundrums of inheritance. Um, in the case of Munira, for example, whose husband wasn't able to have children, but she stayed with him forever. But uh, upon his death, she realized that he left everything to his nephews. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I liked um, sense I, of betrayal. There is a sense of betrayal in that inheritance scenario. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I wanted to talk to about the um, your question about the periodization of Sharia. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very interesting that working women in the Sudan, uh, and here I want to talk about Northern Sudan because these particular stories were uh, told to me by my mother whom I asked about, tried her, a widow herself, tried to ask her about some question. And she said that this whole issue became more with the strict application of Sharia she felt that when she was growing up, and my mom is 74, she said when she was growing up in the, in the Sudan, their neighbors who happened to work in the market um, actually didn't, didn't uh, confine themselves for four months. Uh, and because they were working in the marketplace, another, another one, because her husband beat her on her wedding night. So when he died, she said, I'm not going to spend one <laughs> for that dumb <drama." laughs> man. <laughs> so I go back to, to what um, Ben said in the beginning of this conversation. That is, widowhood is also much about marriage. And I think the experiences of that, I mean, if you are angry enough at the husband, you may be more critical of the whole enterprise of wedding, uh, of, um, of Idda or internment. Mm. 
so mm -hmm. I talked about the um, betrayal here, the polygamy. I think it, it showed in Matthias when he talked about how women can also undercut mm -hmm. other women. Uh, this is also relating to the 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 moral degradation that people talked about during al-Bashir, that since Omar al-Bashir came to power in 1989, of course, Nimeri before him also started criminal and genocide there, but with a strict uh, enforcement of Sharia law, it became very difficult for people actually to have any margin of movement. Uh, so um, that is why in the polygamous marriages, they, they actually say, okay, uh, not every region in the Sudan actually celebrated or accepted polygamy. There were a lot of people who actually divorced husbands. Okay, you got married here. Take these five kids and go with a new wife. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. It happens. But uh the the issue of the secret wives there is something else i wanted to talk about the secret wives who come to the house of whaling and tell the senior wife guess what look at this photo <laughs> so there is inheritance to or be higher. we're running a bit we're running a bit short on time so okay so just finally uh, about your issue um, that you asked me to look at in fibrillation. Uh, interesting, again, it's about fantasies for these new husbands. You knew that this woman had been married for 20 years. You, you curate a virginity regardless of the fact that Duma want to go back again. She wants to go back. <laughs> that's, that's the door. She, the doorbell rang, and she's going to go back. Yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry for going over. But... <laughs> Let me just um, uh, while I'm going to the doorbell, maybe you can. Uh, who else has questions? <laughs> yes, Richard. I do. I do have a question for Kate, and that is about the history of wills. So you're talking about intestate, but what is the history of wills in, in Ghana and the Gold Coast? And how does that all fit together? And I'm thinking here of one of my favorite articles is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Colson's article on the wills in, among the Plateau Tonga that came out, I think, in the late 40s, or early 50s. And it really talks about the radical change that wills imposed and how that fit together with, with fundamental changes in the way in which property was conceived and lineage was conceived? Yeah, I think it's a good question. If I'd had more space, I would have been able to talk more about that. So mm. I think there's um, the kind of evolution of customary law in Ghana is a little bit different from what you find in a lot of the Eastern um, Central African examples, because you've got these um, coastal people who have gotten law degrees and are writing about you know fancy laws and customs at the end of the 19th century early 20th century and there was a kind of a big debate and this was touched on in um, Jean Allman and Vicky Tashjan's book about um, defining property mm -hmm. because some people argued that under customary law um, property had to become family property so that when that people could make a will they could make an oral statement of wishes um, and there were specific akan terms for kind of oral will making mm. but what happened in the 20th century the kinds of properties people acquired began to change particularly with cocoa farms in rural areas and then the real upsurge of the value of houses in urban areas and so Sorry about that. quite a debate about um, how far the individual actually had the right to bequeath their property to anybody else. Um, so there was a kind of a contestation mm -hmm. around whether um, handing out individual property was actually consistent with your obligations as a lineage member because, you know, what you had got came from the investments that had previously been made in you 
And so in the mid 20th century, or certainly the first few decades of the 20th century, this kind of distinction grew up between the so-called lineage property or the family property as it's called in Ghana and the so-called self-acquired property and in a way the notion of the self-acquired property went together with this emphasis on the right of the individual to make a will um, and Victoria Tashjan and Vic, uh, Jean Orman talk a bit about that in their book mm. um, so it, I also kind of mentioned in the paper that um, there had been a kind of constitutional, uh, sorry, a, a statutory limitation on the freedom of the testator. So mm -hmm. the, um, the Wills Act in 1971 had actually put that um, limitation on the freedom of the testator and said that a spouse could not be, a spouse or child could not be denied reasonable, reasonable provision out of the estate of a deceased. But obviously that act only helps spouses and children of people who'd actually made a will. And a lot of people throughout the 20th century, probably the majority, um, die without leaving a will. There's not a very strong culture of will making. So um, I don't know how far I've answered your question, but I think the amount of debate that has been had about intestate succession law is reflective of the fact that it's only a minority of people who actually make wills. Could just quickly follow up on that. To what extent is will making more prevalent in say uh, Christian communities? I think possibly it is in the sense that um, well, I mean, if we go back to the idea of like the Presbyterian Church in the late 1920s having these regulations which said that if a male member died intestate, his property had to be divided in thirds. So that kind of tells me that even when people became Christians, they were not necessarily making a will. And I think that's still the case now. There's no sort of necessary correlation between being a Christian and making a will. But I do, I have been told that um, women's church groups um, and church groups generally is one of those areas where will making is discussed. And sometimes maybe that's part of kind of um, the emphasis of a lot of Christian churches on kind of personal management and a kind of a prosperity gospel and so on. I haven't done enough ethnogra ethnographic research in churches now to be able to say that with certainty but I, I have a sense that in big urban churches maybe there is more discussion about the need for will making and a more emphasis on the desirability of people making a will. Other comments? Other questions? Uh, excuse me. Matthias? Yeah just to follow up on the uh, issue of will. I wanted to find out whether you, you came across anything yeah. like will contestation, where somebody makes a written will and then upon his death, uh, traditionalists come in and then try to challenge the will on the basis that it was supposed to be this and that and that and that. And how such a situation. I think that's like a daily occurrence in Ghana. Right, Kate? Okay. <laughs> it's like, it's the national pastime. It's will contestation. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in about will contestation. I know um, Maxim Bolt has been working on a, like a new project on wills for a few years. Um, I mean, if, if we're still looking for other contributors in like a written form later, I think he probably has a lot of really great stuff from doing contemporary field work in um, the probate courts in, in urban South Africa and Johannesburg. Oh, I, um, I mean, in Eswatini, it was, you know, the, the whole kind of like will making is part of the NGO cavalcade, like going to rural mm -hmm. communities saying this is what you need to fill out in terms of a will. And this is what community in property versus out of property looks like. And, um, you know, shoring up to folks that there are kind of uh, cases that set certain precedents as how you can manage um, customary court as it converges with like uh, Western rights. Like, you know, there are th three or four steps in like a, a Swati marriage. And if 
like he only does step one, then you still have these rights. But if you go to step two, like if they actually smear your face in the cattle pen, then you're not able to like do this through the Western court system. So it's, it's kind of this like organic and like cybernetic switching um, that is always kind of incomplete, I guess, by virtue of the orality of customary law and things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly not, the, not quite the norm and maybe a, a pastime, sure, but not one that people necessarily enjoy to <laughs> be possessed by. Emily, thanks for um, the notes too, yeah. Oh, sorry, Kate, what were you saying? I just wanted to say Max and I have actually spoken quite a bit about this because in his family oh. house project, he's looking at the claims of lineages over houses. Whereas in a way what I'm looking at in Ghana is kind of an opposite trajectory where the national statutes have actually insisted that on the rights of uh, widows and children to the house, whereas Max's project is kind of tending in the other direction. Mm. So we've kind of talked about how, um, you know, both countries are signatories to the CEDAW, and mm. yet you've got these two different pulls in the way widow rights are working. So, yeah, it is a, it's a really interesting point of comparison between Ghana and South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I just thought like the the house or the home kind of like a dwelling space is an interesting convergence between both of these um, papers. I mean, you know, again, like what is actually this like tenant in common right that is afforded to these widows? Um, just so struck uh, about like the boredom in the house, the people being expelled from the house and um, it, it, you know, kind of was making me think like, Kate, you, you brought up the potashes like rights in persons and i wonder if like we're thinking about um you know like wealth in people but like how, how different forms of material and immaterial wealth you know property or like children they're they're being distributed through like this liminal figure of the widow or the bereaved or people at the end of of life it's it's like these are like by virtue of their liminal status this is how you know, those who are empowered, i.e. men, can make these claims to access wealth. It's like precisely through this like precarious figure of the widow or like, you know, that we make her precarious at the same time as we're grabbing something through her. Um, it's like a vector for the movement of wealth or, or these, these rights, um, how that's embodied and disembodied in the widow. Um, but the house, like where it happens is, is crucial. You know? So um, we've come to the end of the hour and as much I know people want to keep chatting but what I would like to just suggest is we just have a little five minute break and then because then we're going to come back to sort of a plenary wrap-up conversation mm -hmm. oh. is that okay of course by all means if you want to keep chatting just, that's fine yeah. but I just want to give people the time to bathroom coffee yes. dog yeah whatever it is um so this was a really generative close and it's interesting um casey you weren't with us for the earlier sessions but you actually um you you picked up the threads um and mm. the, especially the betty potash thread <laughs> so so we'll talk um i've as i said in the chat i i i drafted notes mm. um that i think could be useful for us to to take up um during this last session let's take a moment take a break. If you want to download the document, it might be easier for you to work with on your own screen, but I can also do a screen share. Um, so walk the dogs, get a drink of water, come back. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. I'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> okay.